Okay. And I'm Ben. Well, that was weird. Uh, okay, so hopefully you can hear us now. We got get another classic, and I'm Ben intro. Brilliant, Ben. Uh, but <laughs> so this film is uh, weird. I I first saw it like, as in I came across the fact it existed a year or two ago, and I was like, this film looks odd, and I really wanted to watch it. Uh, for some reason, I didn't. Then I don't know why, because. It's kind of it's it's an animated sci-fi with quite a dark tone. So it follows um, this ragdoll that has uh, been made by a scientist and come to life, who awakens in a and post-apocalyptic future, uh, and then he basically tries to he finds other ragdolls that are like him, and they're being like hunted and killed by these weird machine things that they basically get together to destroy and then uh spoilers release the souls of the other ragdolls at the end yes indeed uh, would you say that's fair i would indeed say that is fair <clears throat> cool so let's talk about the plot Where because this, so this film is an hour and 20 minutes. Yeah. And I felt that it was both too long and too short at the same time. Yeah, I Does felt that sense? as well. It was... So... I mean, to be fair, it might have had something to do with the fact I was watching it on 1.5 times speed, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> In a rush as always. Uh, well... Watch The Clone it... Wars. I will watch the Clone Wars. <laughs> uh, I see what you mean because I don't know. Sometimes it did feel like it dragged a little bit, and the pacing was a bit slow. But it did seem like quite a lot happened. Yeah, it, it at felt... the same time they were all sort of just encounters against different creatures, and it did feel like it repeated itself quite a bit. Yeah, it was quite. Mm. Um, I don't know how to explain it. It. It did feel action packed. I was thinking the whole time, you know, it, there's, you know, there's never really any downtime, or when there is, you know, it's plot heavy downtime. Um, there's not like any dialogue that's just there. Um, but it also felt like it. I think it dragged because it was quite formulaic. So one would say, oh, nine would say, I want to do this. One would say, no. And then nine does anyway. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That stuff happens. <laughs> um, so that that could be why it felt like that. But also, even though the plot was kind of, it, it felt too short as well because not that much was explored. Because basically, yeah. because I really like the tone and the setting. Well, more the setting, I guess. So much, like just the dark, grimy kind of steampunk animated style like there's there's a lot to look at in this film you, you know there's even though i guess you could say the resolution maybe isn't great that kind of works with it like visually it's i would say it's amazing just yeah like the green for the souls and um the like mechanical stuff with the weird spindly legs uh, i i really liked the the look of it and yeah, <clears throat> yeah. It was like one shot in particular. I remember like one sitting in front of the uh, exploding 
factory. Well, it had exploded. That that was a, a really cool shot. I liked that one. I also mm. think I they did quite a good job of world building and making it like an immersive atmosphere, but also like presenting it from obviously these characters who were quite naive and clueless about the situation. But then, I mean, I'm sure we'll come on to it, but it's quite an interesting idea how like the the fall of mankind, just their own problem, and it was like self-perpetuating with like building the robots and things. Yeah, it's definitely seems to be a kind of like a metaphor for uh, atomic power. So yeah. you can see the scientists as being Albert Einstein, and uh, you know he creates what could be this great method for power, but ends up being used as a massively destructive bomb so mm. in this it's the same kind of vein where the scientist says he wanted to create a machine that could create other machines but you know there's a skynet situation and uh the machines turn on the humans and start destroying them all and then in like, yeah. a last ditch attempt the scientist puts his soul into these little rag dolls that he creates so i i, I did like that even though i guess it's fairly standard because the time period, even though it's like people sort of call it a future, like post-apocalyptic future, it's more 30s, 40s era, yeah. um, which makes it really, you know, gives it that cool steampunk aesthetic and everything, uh, which I think if it was more future future, it it wouldn't feel as you... Actually, it probably would still be unique, but it wouldn't have that same dark tone which i quite liked yeah yeah and i think it's quite unique having the perspective of like quite fragile creatures who have outlived humanity but also still have obviously parts of the scientists in them and it's all about like a balance and equilibrium between them with all like conflicting ideas and stuff and like the tensions within the group especially with between one and nine yeah because it's uh, the machines said to be evil because they lacked the human element, so they were extremely intelligent but could be easily manipulated and uh, put to like the wrong use because they've got no empathy. Yeah. And so there's a kind of thing about what makes things human is one of the themes. So, you know, the the machines have intelligence, they learn things, they can create, but uh, because they lack any emotions, are they really? Can they be classed as humans? Because they they are just kind of seen as the baddies. Um, whereas the dolls do actually have like a soul in them. Uh, so you you can see that they all show empathy. Even even number one, who's a bit, he's a bit annoying, but yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. Do you think we should briefly mention how? This was based on like a a short that came out in two thousand and five. Yeah, which so we watched beforehand. Shane Acker, I think, yeah, uh, he has made. I think he originally was making short films, and he made uh, nine, the short film in two thousand and five, which is basically just ten minutes of nine, uh, and he's with five at the start fighting the beast. Five gets killed, and then nine gets the also goes against the beast, gets the weird little circle thing with all the souls and then releases the souls. So that's the plot of the short film and you can kind of see why I think the fact it's from that short film, it was Oscar nominated and stuff, which I assume is why they made the film And it, but it also has no dialogue so it's quite yeah. uh, universal in its appeal, but because it's based on that short film you can see why it felt uh, too long and too short at the same time because it felt too long because it was making a 10 minute short an hour and 20 minutes and um, it felt too short because because it was based on this short film which obviously doesn't have much time to explore ideas it it, it could have done stuff but it kind of didn't want to stray too far from the short I think so they um they just didn't expand much on it like this 
the world felt so in depth, and there were so many creative things like the three and four cataloging everything, and they've got like a book which has threads in it that lead to other objects, like a an archive or something. You know, they're cool characters, and the seven, the kind of like warrior figure. Um, it's there's a lot of interesting things, but they don't look into them or uh like the themes of obviously the war bringing on the destruction of all life isn't really explored it feels kind of hollow i guess yeah i think the short was able to do a lot of the things that the whole film did just as well despite obviously no dialogue and a limited length but obviously uh well one thing that we mentioned as well it was like the use of music in the short seemed to be a lot more memorable and a lot more, uh, like a lot more fitting with the environment than it was in the actual film. Yeah, so in, the short has like quite uh, industrial, gritty, you know, drum loops uh, and that kind of sound like distorted, distorted drum loops, and it sounds quite like impactful. But then in the film, they went for a just a bog standard orchestral score and i remember when i was watching the film and it was just this orchestral score i was like they could have done it could have been so cool with like a weird steampunk uh kind of set vibe music it you know it could have done a lot like maybe even nine inch nails kind of stuff it would i think it would have just brought it up to a, a whole new level What did you think of the music, Ben, at 1.5 times speed? Um, I mean, well, obviously, if you play at 1.5 times speed, it gets a bit distorted, but I don't know. It it was all right. It was... I didn't really notice it. Um, I guess I, I kind of agree. I don't think it was... It, it could have gone for a different sort of vibe and fit a bit better. It just seemed to be sort of the generic orchestral score you get with a lot of films um that just yeah. it like it, it it serves its purpose but it doesn't like it doesn't it, it's neutral it's not good if that makes sense yeah it it's not something out. yeah yeah it it doesn't stand out from the crowd it doesn't it's not what one of the good points of the film equally it's not a bad point but it's just, you know, not very creative, I don't think. I haven't actually I mean, seen that... the for the short film uh, yet, because I'm very prepared like that. Um, but, yeah, I I'd love to see that and see how the music differs. Uh, yeah. One thing that I think is a shame, though, is that Shane Acker hasn't actually done any writing or directing since. He's just done visual effects. Mm. Um and it, it it's quite uh, he he did direct a, a short in 2010 called plus minus but it seems very uh it's not very well known um yeah and that's kind of a shame because he is quite a unique style and I, and I would like to have seen more as he kind of, as he developed and um you know if he learn about fleshing out stories or uh if he delved into kind of the sci-fi genre it does because... have, yeah there's definitely a lot of potential but I, I wonder if this was like his vision that he wanted to pursue and that's why he yeah. followed up with a film in two well the ninth of the ninth 2009 it was the short definitely looked like a labor of love uh type yeah. thing and I don't know if because nine it just obviously in the sci-fi genre you can do quite a lot with in-depth themes which it has hints of but it doesn't fully go for because sci-fi can be quite contemplative and yeah I mean just on the music side there was that scene where they like found the record player and. Oh yeah, that was quite a cathartic moment. But um, and like obviously, I think it played somewhere over the rainbow then. But 
I think Tom mentioned before we started that he like felt that was going to be the end of the film, but then it sort of dragged on for another 20 minutes or so, and it just seemed like, to me, it was just repeating a lot of the what we'd already seen with like the, the yeah. monsters and whatever. The only really new revelation was the fact that the souls could be released. Yeah. Apart from that... Because I, I guess I liked his Tom died. Uh, I think so. Yes. Um, I liked the idea of having the the scientist's soul be put into each of the ragdolls and um, they getting trapped in the the mach- the machine and you can only set them free once you've uh, taken back the amulets. But I don't know, like. The, you could have had that revelation a bit earlier, I feel. Um, it, it was, what, an hour and 20 minutes? I don't think the extra 20 minutes was necessarily needed. It was All it was no. was just finding out that the scientists did this and then going to rescue the souls, and then the souls get rescued, and that's it. I actually said that to Ollie before the episode. Yeah, I yeah. just yeah. mentioned that. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I thought it was either end with them, like the happy ending, or that then they'd just be killed by the machine at the end. Yeah, <laughs> I saw that. I'm sure but... a lot of them actually do, but... Yeah. And then I thought that they'd put the bodies, or put the souls like back in the bodies, but they kind of, like, they release them, and then it starts raining, and it's suggested that they're going to make new life forms. Yeah, I quite, yeah. I quite liked that ending, but could you not have had that 20 minutes earlier, you know? Yeah. Well, I guess it's co- sort of like nine as this newcomer to the group is driven by, like, optimism, especially when he encounters two. And uh, that's sort of what's that... To me, that's what that represents at the end, the optimism that they can have a brighter future, even though the whole world's ended pretty much. Yeah. Mm. And And there's also a lot about questioning... Uh, I guess maybe authority. No, not really authority. It was just saying like, do ask questions about like what, what's why we are here. It was it was almost encouraging philosophical thinking. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which is why it felt like it was more of an adult thing. But also, the rest of the dialogue was really simple and kind of like tried to be made for kids. Yeah, Even that's. The dead bodies. Should we move on to that then? Like, what? Okay, because yeah. I didn't, really sorry, I cut out while talking about that. <laughs> I cut out while <laughs> I don't know what I cut out, so I didn't know if I said anything about that. So yeah, the tone seems to be. It feels like the creator wanted to make it kind of a dark animated sci-fi for adults, but maybe some higher ups uh, made him make it suitable for kids as well. Mm. because it felt like it could have been quite a lot darker and but also gone into some uh, more in-depth ideas, but the dialogue's quite simple. You know, it's, it's really just them talking about what they're going to do next. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and the there's, like, some weird moments that seem to be for kids, like when Eight gets a magnet up of his head. <laughs> Yeah, but is that for like, kids? Ooh. That's not. That's, that's either. A, that's probably a drugs reference. Um, but yeah, I. The one of the I only had two really main criticisms about the film, and one of them is the fact that it was kind of skating the line between more mature themes and like a kids movie, because it it could have gone either way. Um, like, and I'm sure a lot of kids would enjoy this and stuff, but it's rated. A 12A, and I'm assuming that a lot of that's to do with, like, not necessarily the violence, although maybe to a degree it's a bit more than you get in your traditional PG, but um, probably more just the dead bodies and stuff, like the character. I don't think that it, this, I don't think this would be suitable for kids, to be honest. Or yeah, smaller it's kids. Because in PGs it's and stuff. too dark, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was very dark. You have some. You, you, the characters die and stuff, but this was very, very outright that they're dead and uh, their souls are trapped and 
all of the humans and robots have gone to war and they've completely annihilated each other apart from this uh, machine. And that that's kind of a very dark thought to think about and probably not a good one for kids to mull over. Um, yeah, it, that, it must be some kind of, like, higher-ups or something. I don't know, it just annoyed me. I mean, in the IMDb Parents Guide, Frightening and Intense Scenes are severe, which is higher than the ones for Slender Man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but it's just... Does it... Do you know, like, that r- Parents Guide, is that, like relative to the rating like that's severe in terms of it being no it's just what people that would still be severe i mean i guess it's subjective as to who actually writes it to be fair yeah Yeah. there's quite high stakes though throughout i'd say uh and it just but they just keep it for kids like it's quite dark obviously the souls being trapped and then constantly being chased by these dark, ominous, monstrous machines, which would also be probably terrifying for kids. Yeah, and but... to, and the uh, the scenes where the ragdolls are being held up and the souls are literally being sucked out of them, and then they go limp yeah. and lifeless afterwards, I, I could see that would be quite scary for younger kids. We just don't really get many post-apocalyptic films for kids in general. <laughs> it it yeah. doesn't really seem to... But at the same time, I think it's quite interesting that it's got that uh, like it's sort of facade that it's meant to, it's going to be all that it's going to be kid friendly and it's a film like that but in reality it's quite a lot it's quite depressing and dark but at the same time it's still quite optimistic as I said at the end yeah but at the same time I think that might have might turn some people away from it because either they're kids and it's not appropriate for them or they think it's a kids film and then it's unappealing but in reality it's not really either. It's sort of like a grey area between a kids' film and an adult one. Yeah, and I guess this kind of sort of but leads it's kind on of the to annoying grey area. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this kind of sort of leads on to one of my other criticisms, which was the fact that the characters were all pretty much caricatures. Like they weren't. Like you kind of you you in, you enjoyed and you sympathised, uh, empathised with nine a lot. But all of these characters you've seen before, um, so you know yeah. the optimistic, slightly naive protagonist who makes everything right in the end, the older, more pessimistic leader who knows a secret but keeps it from people, the plucky, uh, strong female character, um, the, I, I guess the 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 comedy relief um, with eight, um, who's the big buff character who doesn't talk much is a bit dumb and gets killed off you know it's you've seen all of these people so um, all these characters in other films before um so there's not really it's not really that stimulating it's not much to really think about when it comes to characters because you know you think of any other animated film and you could probably transfer like at least a few of these characters directly over to um the ones in that film, you know, it, yeah, it, which is why also it felt like it should have been longer because you would have grown to know these characters more. Like there's somebody that even though they kind of are like archetypes and stuff, there's a lot of interesting ideas. Like three and four being the kind of, uh, like they they never speak and their eyes seem to be able to take photos and they like catalog everything and they've got a big book which is a kind of an encyclopedia with strings that attach to all these other items and that's a cool idea and i would you know it's stuff like that that i wish i could see fleshed out more yeah if it yeah. had a longer runtime so just... there's like cool sci yeah it's cool just uh in terms of its ideas and themes but they're not fleshed out that much and also cool in terms of its creative ideas which also don't get seen enough of i think Hmm. Yeah. I just think the characters could have been a bit more unique, you know, and maybe not necessarily all of them, because to a degree they work. But um, I guess the fact that all of these are very reminiscent of other characters you've seen in, especially, say, kids' animated movies, like, 
I don't know, you could probably map a load of them onto like Finding Nemo or something and they'd be pretty similar characters. Um, it's just that sort of gives off the... that adds to the whole It's for Kids vibe with um, all of these characters you've seen in other films when in reality it's a completely different setting. It's very dark and depressing. Um, you know, humanity's pretty much been annihilated by its own creation and... Uh, all of these characters end up dying and their, their souls get trapped. That's a very different situation to, say, Finding Nemo, but um, the characters are still the same. So that just sort of further adds to the impression that it's for kids and stuff, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's just annoying. Like, I'm just thinking back on all the stuff that it has and could have been so much more because I loved so much about it, the setting and the tone and stuff. But I just oh, I'm trying to think of con- some constructive criticism. What what would I have done instead with the characters? I guess. Um, well, I quite like the idea that they like each one had obviously the number on the back, so they were identifiable in that way. So you, I, I see what you mean about them being caricatures in a way, but I think you can still tell them apart like they don't blend into each other which is yeah i, th- I think yeah. that's sort of representative of the fact that they're meant to embody this scientist's soul that he's passed on yeah and all of them different parts of it i guess but um yeah you know. so i don't really it'd be quite difficult to like not make them archetypes of things you've seen before in kids films but I um, know that's not very constructive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, stuff I would have done differently just in general would probably be, uh, like, I get, make the soundtrack kind of more dr- electronic drum-driven. I think that'd be cool. Um, and then I think for the characters, you can kind of, if it had a bit more, because we said, like, there's a lot of action set pieces, but they're kind of, Samey, even though the monster designs and stuff are really cool, maybe you could have more downtime with the characters and learn about the kind of I don't know if they want anything because you know they're not like humans and do they have any aspirations? Say because they you only really get to see them try to survive, and that's mm. it really. So it could be interesting to see. Uh, if they do have kind of hopes or if or if they are just depressed in this post apocalyptic world um and cuz there's stuff like five well, what his like he really looks up to two but his kind of thing isn't inventing as much as it was for two and nine uh, he seems to kind of enjoy using the inventions and he you know he's seen as like the observer at the top of the tower, uh, and I think again, it's just exploring the themes and ideas of it a bit more. Yeah, something that I quite liked in terms of the characters, which is definitely to do with the fact that it was originally this short film, is that um, because obviously in that, as we mentioned, there is no dialogue, and obviously that could, there is at the start, like Nine can't speak at the start because he like doesn't have his voice box, but. Uh, and obviously you couldn't continue that throughout the whole film, but I quite liked the fact that it was quite reliant on like the body language and the facial expressions of the characters, so quite a lot of the time, especially in like, the action scenes, he, he got quite a close look at when we main and I sort of see his reactions to this environment, which I found quite compelling. Yeah. Hmm. Trying to think of but, other things to say. Do you think it has any kind of? I've not seen this anywhere, but I couldn't tell if it was kind of had a bit of an anti-religion theme. I don't know if this makes sense, but uh, like one is obviously kind of seen. He's dressed as a like almost a bishop with the weird hat thing, and he's literally in a chapel, and is and he always says about like not asking questions. And then it could be seen as nine being kind of like science and 
wanting to explore themes and ideas behind stuff but i does that I make sense so. or am i being an idiot i see <laughs> but what you it also might not have been intentional well i guess maybe anti like organized religion or i don't know yeah. maybe specifically catholicism it, yeah cause, because cause it was actually quite spiritual in a way about yeah you know releasing souls and what makes a human and stuff like that yeah which so, I, th I think was good because they were able to explore humanity despite you didn't really well you saw a few humans but not directly like it was all all the focus was put on these creations yeah which i did really like and i liked seeing the kind of like history of what happened because it was kind of uh it's almost like bioshock infinite I don't, I don't know if you've played that but in the black and white um like old wartimey apocalypse stuff yeah and uh, yeah it's one of those that i saw somewhere someone said like if this had been made into a horror adventure netflix series now it would have a massive following and i i would actually love to see something like that because then yeah. you yeah. get the characters more in depth and also the action set pieces it'd be more like broken up and in separate episodes and that would really work and i i just love the setting so much but basically this film disappointed me but it wasn't bad yeah i yeah. just want i wanted it to be amazing the only thing is, though, um, what would you do with the series? Because uh, it felt like the story ran out at about the hour mark. So unless you were doing, like, three 20-minute episodes, 4.15 or whatever, I couldn't really see much more you could do with the story because the whole point is the only... All humans are gone, and the, as far as they can see, all the robots are gone as well, apart from the beast and then this mm. thing. Well, I get what you mean, but I think it was too fast-paced. So it would have been more about drip feeding. So you'd, because it it basically shows the scientists instantly at the start. So you wouldn't have that. That would be a more slow reveal. And mm. the beast felt like the main thing, and then just gets killed off quite quickly. Like literally, one of the characters just slices its head off. I guess so, you could have gone more into characters and more into yeah. Their I'd power basically their slow it all down. Yeah. yeah, is what I would do, and, and then some, uh, get more character it stuff like it in. Was and... a bit slow. I don't know. You could have had nine, I guess, at the top of the watchtower a lot with uh, five, and at the end of the first episode, he decides to go out and look for two or something, maybe. Yeah, because mm. rather than just instantly rebelling, he kind of just takes one's word, but then starts to feel worse and worse, and slowly goes right no i'm gonna go and look for him yeah because i also prefer it when when it was just kind of showing these like ruined abandoned uh like robots that had guns on them like when you just saw that when they went into their factory and you didn't mm. know what it was for i really liked that kind of atmosphere and if if it had more of that so it's kind of i think it's got a similar vibe to portal the portal games in the evil machine type stuff uh and that is very much you only see bits of stuff behind the scenes it never kind of fully just explains what's going on and if it was more kind of like a discovering things and it's like a mystery to piece together i think that'd be cool yeah yeah i guess it would only be trying to write it right go on uh, well, I was just going to say, if if it was a series, I guess it wouldn't... Even if you did slow it down, it could only really be like six or like maybe eight episodes at most. Because again, you'd kind of run out of story and you could be really... nine episodes. Oh, <laughs> wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> Probably would be nine episodes. Probably would. Um, but you'd, you couldn't really do a season two unless you slowed it down to 0 0.25 times speed. Well, you can always think of more story afterwards. It's, yeah, it's just, I can't really think of much else you could do with the setting. Once you've defeated the robots, yeah. what do you do? More robots. <laughs> yeah. And, well, unless you find yeah, some humans, maybe? I don't know. That could be a thing. It, I think, I don't know, it's just, if they made it, if they didn't try and make it PG-13 or 12A, which it is, 
it, then they could maybe explore things a bit more. Mm. And I'd like to see that. Yeah. Cool. Uh, oh, I just want to mention that this is produced by Tim Burton, which... So, I don't, I don't think he had anything to do with the original short, but it kind of makes sense of the dark fantasy sci-fi setting. I can see why Tim Burton would want to attach himself to this film. Yeah, it's very yeah. much in the style of his other movies. Really. Cool. <laughs> oh. oh, we didn't actually really say that about the animation, but oh, yeah, the animation was, was really good. <laughs> yeah, I was... Yeah. I, I, I'm not going to say blown away, because it wasn't like the best I've ever seen, but it was incredibly good. Um... Like from the yeah. like from the start, like the first few shots of um, the scientist assembling the doll and uh, the doll coming to life. Uh, I I love the movement of it. I love the design. Um, you know, I I felt really compelled, not sort of like you know with like the zip and everything. I I like that on all of them. Yeah, I don't know. It was just cool. I enjoyed it. Yeah. It was good. It was indeed. <laughs> Go on then, we'll rate it. <laughs> cool. Well, I've now updated the app, the website, and Ollie has updated the every rating in order page, because he's a groovy fella like that. So, if you go onto our website, entertainmentofexcellence.weebly.com, you can look at this list with us. Um. Well... Hmm. I, I mean, we were a bit naughty beforehand. We were sort of thinking of what we were going to give it. Um, <laughs> Ooh, and... Yeah, me and Ollie were deciding. Disgusting. Yeah. I was busy watching at 1.5 times speed to catch up with you. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, it definitely did have a lot of standout moments. It was unique in the themes it explored in the, a different way to what you usually see. And as you said, like the animation was amazing. Uh, but it, it definitely did have some flaws, and I think the main one was probably you didn't really know what it was, what it was. Like, is it a kids' film or is it not? It did seem like some points were quite fast-paced and were quite slow. Uh, but I don't really know how you'd improve it. So I'd probably give it a six point nine. I'm cool. going to agree with Ollie on that because. When I saw it, I was I was really hyped, and I was like, "This could be amazing." And then it was just kind of like pretty good. And I know that a lot of people still gush over it, but I think that's more them liking the vibe, yeah, rather than yeah. the actual film. Like, I mean, it does have some great moments, but it could be so much more. I just want more from it. So I'm gonna go for six point nine, mainly partly because then you get the nine in the rating, but. I was oh, yeah, gonna go give it a nine. Mm. <laughs> I was gonna give it a six point eight, but I'm gonna round it up to six point nine so we have our first unanimous review for like a while. And so we get the nice uh, solid yeah. nine. We're breaching uh, the gap between heavy metal and the two popes now. <laughs> yeah. We are. You you know what six is? It's an upside down nine. It is. Whoa. So we've got it's basically two nines. It is. Yeah. That is cool. <laughs> I enjoyed that. I did actually find a unanimous rating, but I can't remember what it was. <laughs> I was looking through. Hopefully that'll bring our median down a little bit, because our median's quite skewed. <laughs> it's usually... Oh, heavy metal's unanimous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the median is a bit skewed, yeah. We seem to only rate films that we, we like. Let's stop doing that. <laughs> Yeah, because like theoretically, five's meant to be like the average, but we've generally been giving around sevens because we've usually done. We either do films we like, we know we'll sort of enjoy, or intentionally really bad films. <laughs> so it kind of, it kind of goes down a little bit, a little bit, and then just drops off. <laughs> With like Slender Man, Kangaroo Jack, Robot Monster. Um, fun things There's like still that. a gap, a gap between Robot Monster and Slender Man. There is. Maybe we could try and bridge that at some point. Indeed. Ooh. 
I mean, we've done over 20 films that are rated in the sevens. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we should we to tell you what. look for something above a seven. We need to also look for an amazing film. Yeah, yeah. we need something that's in the nines. Because... Ooh, nine. Oh, that's get the theme nine. of the episode. Yeah, it's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. I like it. Uh, cool. And in our uh, animation category now. It's yeah. Absurd. Um, we should do some films around the five mark. And you know what would be great? It would be great if you listeners could send in some films for us to watch <gasps> that are around the five mark. Stuff that Whoa. isn't as good. Make make us suffer, but like not in the <laughs> slender man <laughs> way. More in the mile well, twenty two. Right? Birdemic is a perfect five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it was one in terms of quality, but ten in terms of entertainment. So yeah. So if you know any films that are similar quality to Birdemic, then. <laughs> Well, I have that. one in mind. Well, because like, yeah, I've got one in mind that we could do. Oh, I'm excited. I, I don't know if it's on the schedule, so I won't spoil it yet. Because we've got something planned for next week. Indeed. We, but you can go and have a look at the schedule if you sign up to our mailing list at entertainmentofexcellence.weebly.com. It will be sent to you when you subscribe. Right, well, before Tom runs on to the uh, recommendations, we actually have a submission spotlight uh, <gasps> submission this week. Well, incredible, I know. Um, we did... Uh, we, we, we didn't get an interview with the creator this time, which is fair enough, but we might end up interviewing her at some point in the future if she does another thing. So... Uh, that will be cool. In the meantime, uh, we're just going to have a look at the short film she did um, called The 911 Call. Um, when we say short film, it's, it's incredibly short. Yeah. Um, it's a whole 1 minute 32 seconds. Um, have Have you two seen it? Uh, yeah. 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 So I guess we could just go right into it then. Just what stuff did you like? You can play it on air if you want, or uh, or yeah, sure. I'll I'll sort that out while you um just give your overview and stuff. Uh, well, I don't want to spoil anything, but so this is like obviously a project that is just kind of a passion project rather than uh, a professionally made thing. And one of the aims of it is uh, to put more diversity into horror films. So I think it's uh, the creator is hoping for more black women uh, in horror films because horror films have been like some of the most egregious offenders of kind of like... Uh, putting archetypes of like you know there's the whole thing of the black character always dies first so it, it would be good to push horror in like a more progressive direction which has been kind of happening with uh jordan peele with his films like get out and us um and it, i think it is so it's a you know it's a good aim because it helps people have more representation and characters that they can identify with which uh is quite an important thing because sometimes you can just kind of feel alone if you're not represented on screen. So that's like one of the aims of this short film or microfilm. Oh, it's so, uh, Ben, you mentioned that it kind of has like a two sentence horror vibe, a yeah, two sentence horror. Uh, and yeah, I'd agree. So it's it's quite limited. Uh, I always find it interesting when people do projects that have like really strict limits on because that can really uh increase creativity of uh you know when you're making something so i know a lot of music producers do it as well it can just get these like really interesting ideas and obviously as a horror it's quite difficult to do much in a minute and a half for the scares so 
having the eerie kind of like you know quick twist is uh i think it's pretty good for a minute and a half <laughs> yeah yeah it's, it's very difficult to have a twist and like a horror aspect in that length of time because if you take out like the credits and stuff it's probably less than a minute yeah yeah and i i as i said i i really enjoyed the fact it was pretty much all made on an iphone as well so it, it proves that you know you don't need fancy technology um and a huge budget to create a good film like you know obviously if she was going for something a, a bit longer um maybe like a cool camera or something could have helped but um for what it is it's really good it's a really good well spent one minute 32 seconds um yeah the it does well of doing like the it's always got like a kubrick influence with the slow zoom on the picture at the start and the dripping tap yeah so it does I well of that building the tension that way you know like it's like the end of the shining that the photo thing and i'm always a fan of the dripping tap <laughs> shots yeah. that seem to appear in films but you also get to see her like walk in through the mirror um mm, yeah so like a lot of stuff like that is just getting creativity into just like one minute uh is great and having that tension it, it is cool uh, and it's promising so i'll be looking out <laughs> yeah for cool. if they do any more short films yeah yeah the only slight constructive criticism I would have of the film is um, for the scene in the bathroom where she's on the 911 call. Um, maybe she could have benefited from a, a mic that isn't on the camera because it was quite echoey and uh, like it wasn't bad. It was, um, you could definitely discern what she was saying and it was quite clear, but maybe an, another mic could have helped. But um, obviously, given it was made um, using a camera and edited on a phone, that might not have been possible for what it was. Um, yeah. But apart from that... Uh, and I, I think making it on like just an iPhone 7 and stuff like that, it's a, a great way to show people that if you want to make a film, you know, just go out and, and make something. Yeah, definitely. That yeah, anyone could you just... If you've got an idea, uh, you know, just shoot it, get it down on paper, yeah, do a mm. few shots and put it together, and we can so talk I think from it's... past experience of making films. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, you two have made some hits, like the uh, <laughs> Hunger Games spin-off, which I hear was received about as well as uh, Solo, a Star Wars story. What did we film that on? It was on a phone. Uh, no, it was on a. It was on a tiny uh camera it was only 720p as well so um yeah <laughs> sorry i thought that was the cost of the <laughs> <laughs> no like i was like seven pounds 20 for a that camera that's pretty seven pounds 20p <laughs> oh. no it's more like five pounds <laughs> <laughs> anyway um just one last thing uh, the whole thing about you if you want to make a movie go out and do it um this film was nominated for four different uh festival and nominations awards and stuff um so according to the youtube description um it was nominated for the At atlanta horror film festival it was part of the official selection uh the alt ff i feel i've probably pronounced that wrong alternative no, it's alternative film festival so yeah alt ff yeah, Alt FF, Alternative Film Festival. It was a semi finalist and nominated for the Best Writer Award. I can see that actually. It's, it was good writing for 1 minute 32 uh, film. Cult Critic Movie Rewards, which was a finalist for, um, and was part of the official selection of the Direct Monthly Online Film Festival. So if you can, if the. If the creator of this can just make this with a camera, a phone, and edit mostly on a phone and get nominated for four awards, then, you know, there's no excuse why you can't do it. Just get it out there, put it on YouTube. Um, and, yeah. Do it. <laughs> yeah, do, do it. it. I've just realised we haven't actually referred to her by name. Um, 
I don't. I'm, I feel like I'm gonna pronounce it wrong. Is it Jaya? Jaya Giles, I think. I I could be wrong. Um, and I, if you listen again, I've pronounced that wrong. I apologize. Should have probably looked this up beforehand. Um, but <laughs> we'll leave a link in the description. Um, go check her out and follow her and see what stuff she's putting out in the future. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, thank you for. Thank you very much for submitting this. It's our first submission spotlight in quite a while. Um, yeah. Hopefully we will have some more in the future. We do have one other one in the works, um, which could end up being quite interesting. But if you are a creator of any kind of entertainment, if it's a short film like this, or some music, or a, another podcast, and you want us to have a look at you, or a YouTube channel or whatever, <clears throat> just send it in um, via the entertainmentofexcellence.weebly.com website or find us on Instagram and Twitter at, at EOV Podcast. haven't been posting there very much lately, unfortunately, but um, we'll see if we can get back to that. Um, but we are active on it. You can just e uh, email us or DM us and we'll get back to you. Um, and we'd love to have you on to discuss it. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't... It wasn't uh, the right circumstances for an interview on this film um, but you know we'd love to talk to you directly and uh, ask a couple questions and give you feedback to your face um, and we don't have to do that live we can have a pre-recorded segment so that would be cool yeah yeah is it time for recommendations ooh it might be. It is. Okay, so I've got two, as usual. I've got to get back up because there was a time that I only had one, which is just oh. disappointing. Uh, so I finished watching Swamp Thing recently, the DC uh, series, uh, and it's it's pretty good. I, I would say it's pretty decent like as a horror... It's, it's, more, it's more just like a horror series, but horror fantasy maybe because obviously it's dc so it's still comic book elements but it's alan moore so fairly dark um and it is annoying it was cancelled after one episode aired because it did get like really good reviews and everything and it's just uh like the plot is pretty cool and the special effects like it uses a lot of practical effects which are really good like you'll just I'm sure Ben would appreciate the practical effects <laughs> oh, yeah. they look great There's a, and a lot of body horror stuff uh, so that's definitely worth a watch but just be warned that it kind of has like one of those endings where it sets up another season but there won't be another season so just be warned and I also re-watched Into the Spider-Verse because that came onto Netflix and uh, that that is still amazing like the animation is so fluid there's so many unique and creative ideas in the animation and the story is great and yeah it's it is it's still really good <laughs> so i watched it in the cinemas when it came out but definitely holds up on a rewatch so watch that as nice. well groovy do you have anything ben no, I'm back to buy old regular no recommendations, unfortunately. Oh, uh, I have one. It's, um, well, you've probably heard of it because it's quite pop. Well, it's really popular on Netflix at the moment. And it's called The Queen's Gambit. And it's like a, a bit of a mini series, a Netflix original. Uh, it is actually, it's based on a book. Um, so it is actually fictional. Uh, I think quite a few people watching the start would have thought it was based on some sort of true event, but it's all, it's not. Uh, it's basically about, like, this orphan who becomes a chess prodigy at, like, the age of nine. And um, she also, well, the first episode, like, explores how she starts to get into chess and also... It's quite a strange situation where the orphanage like have feed them these tranquilizing uh, drugs that she starts to become quite dependent on. 
and so as it progresses as well as like the chess and also like the the family relations with obviously her, her mum that adopted her and then also the other competitors it also explores issues relating to like drug addiction and out she drinks quite a lot as it goes on um especially well i won't give it away but in yeah, please don't because i'm watching it <laughs> well she goes to like a bunch of tournaments something happens at the paris tournament because uh like the final conclusion is that she's meant to go against this uh soviet player who's like the world champion um and then one of the complaint i would have maybe is that it just sort of felt like each episode there was the new big boss that um she had to beat and the like every episode it felt like there was a different best chess player in the world but then obviously as she progresses through the stages they start to get better but i think it as long as well as like the obviously emotional aspects that it explores and the character moments like the chess is pretty good in it as well and it's able to make all the games she plays really entertaining even though there's no dialogue or anything um, yeah because i only know a bit about chess but <laughs> i remember it like you don't really know all the time what's going on but there was one like at the end of like one of the second episodes where she beats someone well they resign because she like forks two of their pieces and that's like the only thing i saw but i was like oh <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i think they do actually have like they i assume some chess expert has planned out all the games for them yeah because i mean it's called the queen's gambit which is like a an opening in chess where you like sacrifice one of your pawns but it it seems like like she used that some of the time but it seems like she's often uses the sicilian defense as well so but it is very authentic like i don't know a bunch about chess but if you do i think it would definitely hold up and it also you don't need to know a lot for it to be entertaining Great. Yeah. Um, anything from you, Ben? No, um, I've, I, I haven't got much. Of course not. <laughs> I'm busy, alright? I, <laughs> I do have you? a book that I am wanting to read at some point. So I thought hopefully... you were going to say that you were writing. I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I'll just I'll submit it to the submission spotlight. <laughs> This submission is from me. <laughs> Check out my it's SoundCloud, bro. Person, so. <laughs> right, well, um, thank you for listening. Next episode, we are going to be discussing... Yeah. Is one of you going to say it? <laughs> oh, are we? I can't oh. remember the name of it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. We stun. Um... We're going to be watching that one sixties film that Ben's grandparents recommended. <laughs> That's what it's called. Check it out. <laughs> if you want to laugh, the reason I did that is because I forgot what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> we can't look it up now. Oh no! No, I'm, I'm, I've got it. Um, just about. Okay. Right. We are watching. Come on, load, please. In the heat of the night, directed by Norman uh, Jewison in was released in 1967 so that is cool go and watch that um we'll post some links on social media if you'd like to watch it um and join us next week as we discuss it what a fun time um one last thing before you go can you all like leave a comment uh partly to this is partly to just give us some constructive criticism like if we've if we're a crap podcast then tell us we're crap and we can improve but also there's a secondary reason i want you all to bully tom into watching the clone wars <laughs> not just the clone wars just know more about star wars in general yeah re-watch maybe just rewatch like a new hope maybe <laughs> I know about a new you hope. didn't a few episodes time if this sounds like a good idea we might do a, a quiz for Ooh, a section we- Return of the quiz. I'm going to hazard a guess that you two know a lot more about Star Wars than the average uh, one of our viewers. It was my hyperfixation for years. (laughs) Anyway, 
leave a comment bullying Tom, and we'll see you next episode. All right, see ya. All right, All see, right ya. see ya. See ya.